Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We have reached this fifth chapter. We are on the 27th episode, paragraph number 7 of the fifth chapter. In our last episode, number 26, we saw how Sri Aurobindo brought the synthesis where he brought the picture of the Vedantic schools of yoga relying on the Purusha, the witness consciousness, which is of the nature of Sat, the pure, silent, stillness, formless, vast, infinite. That's on one side. Then on the other side was the dynamic force, the Shakti, the tantric schools relying on Shakti for all realization, which is of the nature of this creative dynamic force, which can be at rest or in action. And the relationship between the two is of stillness and movement. One is of the nature of Sat, other is nature of Chit. The self-conscious existence and the other is the awareness and force of the creative force of that existence. And from that point of view, looking at nature as the manifestation of the Lord of Yoga or the Supreme Consciousness manifesting into the world and that very process of manifestation is through tapas. And tapas is really the key to all the various schools of yoga where this integration can be brought in. In tapas, there is the divine consciousness dwelling upon its own infinite potentialities and birthing real ideas, which has its certainty of realization in time and space. It moves towards its realization. So psychologically in human beings, these aspects get translated as the will and faith. Will is of the nature of knowledge moving towards its force that is moving towards manifestation. And faith is the reflection of a higher knowledge in the lower nature, where you know the truth of your being. So that faith and will together makes everything possible. Whatsoever you deeply have faith in, you become. And that's the master key to all yogic schools when we remove all the external methods, elaborate processes, when you strip off everything, it will boil down to the simple aspect of faith and the conscious will, which is of the very nature of knowledge, very substance of it is knowledge. A conscious will and faith working together, taking up the truth conceptions, that tapas leads to all realizations. So that's where we arrived at in the last episode. Now, let's now proceed further how he is taking us forward. We see then what, from the psychological point of view, and yoga is nothing but practical psychology, is the conception of nature from which we have to start. This line, yoga is nothing but practical psychology. Very important line to dwell upon because in today's world, when we refer to psychology, most people think of Psychology as it developed in the last 100 years, largely coming from the Western countries. 
Whereas we have yogic schools over thousands of years specializing in inner exploration, the whole range of consciousness, subjective experiences, mapping them meticulously and creating various schools of yoga, embodying a vast collection of knowledge, not only knowledge, but also transformational practices that can fundamentally change the human nature. The Eastern psychology, the yogic psychology is practical psychology. It's not theoretical. It is so experiential, practical, subjective, first person exploration psychology. So this is something very important for us to remember. Yoga is nothing but practical psychology. So in that, it's the conception of nature from which we have to start. This is the starting point Sri Aurobindo is now bringing in. Remember the very first chapter. The first character he introduced was nature, the two necessities of nature. And he will continue building on nature, the two step, three steps of nature, all that eventually is coming back to this conception of nature from where we have to start. Because nature has been looked upon in various ways. And the way you look upon nature will define the way you approach nature. For example, from modern physics perspective, which studies the most material crust of nature. Nature is mechanical in its nature. Its operations are precisely measurable. We can calculate it. We can predict it. That is the machinery part of nature. And therefore, science looks at nature as a machine, whether it is a Newtonian machine or a quantum machine, it is still a machine. And we are looking at how to manipulate that machine, how to engineer that machine to meet our requirements, to utilize nature as a material resource. That's how the physical science looks at nature. Then we have on the other side, the extreme spiritual side looking at nature as an illusion, maya, a transient form that is rising and falling, coming and going, having no fundamental significance. What is real from that point of view is nothing but the pure, empty, silent witness consciousness. So these are two extreme perspectives on nature. So let's see how Sri Aurobindo is looking at nature. It is the self-fulfillment of the Purusha through his energy. So he's using the word he and she here. This is there in Indian yogi conception. The Sat, pure existence, self-conscious existence in its silent, vast, infinite nature is often referred to as he and the force that is arising out of it and manifesting the worlds, the play, the creation is referred to as she, the nature. So it is the fulfillment of the Purusha through his energy. There is energy that is moving from static energy to kinetic energy and manifesting the world. And Purusha is the pure consciousness, pure being. But the movement of nature is twofold, higher and lower. That's the next distinction he is bringing into the way to look at nature. The movement of nature is twofold, higher, higher and lower, or 
as we may choose to term it divine and undivine. So these are two poises of nature, two fold movements of nature, divine and undivine. The distinction exists indeed for practical purposes only. For there is nothing that is not divine. And in a larger view, it is as meaningless verbally as the distinction between natural and supernatural. For all things are that, for all things that are, are natural. On one hand, there is one conscious existence. It is that which is manifesting as this multiplicity. So that's a fundamental reality at a very absolute level. But when it comes to the relative context, for practical purposes, we need to have this distinction. The higher nature and lower nature, the divine nature and undivine nature. It is for the practical purposes of yoga. All things are in nature and all things are in God. But for practical purposes, there is a real distinction. The lower nature, that which we know and are and must remain so long as the faith in us is not changed, acts through limitation and division, is of the nature of ignorance and culminates in the life of the ego. But the higher nature, that to which we aspire, acts by unification and transcendence of limitation, is of the nature of knowledge and culminates in the life divine. So these are the two distinct movements of nature. So what we are, we are part of the lower nature. We are emerging, we are evolving in the lower nature and we aspire to, the evolutionists aspire to reach the higher nature, but our location is in the lower nature. So the lower nature, that which we know and are, what we know is the lower nature and that is what we are also the lower nature and must remain so long as the faith in us is not changed. He is using the word faith again here. Just in the previous synthesis, he brought in this notion of faith. Whatsoever you deeply believe in, you become. As long as we have this inner faith that we are small, divided, ego-bound beings, we are bound to remain so. Unless that faith is changed to that notion, that experience, or that conception that we are fundamentally divine and infinite, that's a shift in faith required to realize that experience. Lower nature, that which we know and are and must remain so long as the faith in us is not changed, acts through limitation and division. So this lower nature is acting through limitation and division, is of the nature of ignorance and culminates in the life of the ego. So that is the culmination of the movements of nature. Lower nature is operating in ignorance and it is working through limitation and division. So one become many and that multiplicity in the lower nature is dividing further and further and formulating not only materially, also psychologically, the individualized entities, but at an ego level 
first is creating multiplicity of species and within a species again making individuals which are unique and when it comes to human beings that ego gets well forged and we do have this deep sense of I am fundamentally separate from the rest. So that's where the sense of division, sense of separation, these are the fundamental tenets of the ego. Ego has this experience, this cognitive limitation where it perceives itself to be separate. Therefore, its faith is that I am separate, I am small, I am not the infinite self because there is no experience of it in its conscious field of awareness. So in the lower nature, this is where it culminates, the formation of a self-conscious ego, which limits itself in its tiny boundary, physical boundary, psychological boundary. So that's where the lower nature culminates. must remain so long as the faith in us is not changed, acts through limitation and division, is of the nature of ignorance and culminates in the life of the ego. But the higher nature, that to which we aspire, so our soul's aspiration is to reach the higher nature, which is of the divine nature. The higher nature, that to which we aspire, acts by unification and transcendence of limitation. This is a fundamental difference. Higher nature is operating through unification and transcendence of limitations, whereas lower nature is working through division and limitation. And this higher nature is of the nature of knowledge and culminates in the life divine. And here he is giving knowledge with a capital K. That is of the knowledge that is true, not an opinion, but a fundamental truth. So on one hand, lower nature is operating in ignorance and higher nature is operating in knowledge and then lower nature is working through division and limitation and higher nature is acting through transcendence of limitations and progressive unification and lower nature culminates in the ego and higher nature culminates in the life divine so this is the fundamental difference and these two movements exist simultaneously in nature and this is what usually get translated into the devas and asuras the forces of light and the forces of darkness and the battle between the two and all the mythological narratives from across the world deals with these two forces these are forces of lower nature and forces of higher nature, the beings of light and beings of darkness, beings that brings division, limitation, destruction, and the beings that bring light, unity, expansion, and transcendence, culminating in life divine. The other one culminating in pain, suffering, and the ego. The passage from the lower to the higher is the aim of yoga and this passage may be may affect itself by the rejection of the lower and escape into the higher that's one possibility and this is what a large number of schools focus upon how to reject the lower nature which is of the nature of limitation of ignorance and ego how to reject it and transcend and go to the higher nature. That is the ordinary view. By the rejection of the lower nature and escape into the higher, the ordinary viewpoint, or by the transformation of the lower 
and its elevation to the higher nature. This is where the integral yoga coming in. So we are not looking at the rejection of the lower nature, but elevation of it and transformation of this lower nature. So transform it, elevate it to its divine possibilities. That's what Sri Aurobindo is bringing in as its integral yoga's objective. It is this, rather, that must be the aim of an integral yoga. It is integral because it is integrating all, bringing a harmonious perfection across and starting from the very core central principle where Sat and Chit are united and the ananda of becoming through the process of tapas where the will and faith play a key role. So the being flowing into becoming and there lies the key to integral yoga and it is also bringing the static and dynamic, the formless and form, the immobile and the mobile, all together in a seamless movement of yogic evolution. But in either case, it is always through something in the lower that we must rise into the higher existence. We exist in the lower nature and therefore it is through something in the lower nature that is already established by nature, we must rise to the higher existence. It is always through something in the lower that we must rise into the higher existence. And the schools of yoga each select their own point of departure or their own gate of escape gate of escape because the word escape so is implying many of the schools consider liberation where you eventually shed the lower nature and ascend and merge into the higher nature so each of them look at one or other point of departure for their escape into the higher nature so the schools of yoga each select their own points of departure or their own gate of escape. They specialize certain activities of the lower prakriti and then and turn them towards the divine. So each school specializes certain activities of lower prakriti. What does it mean? Say, Hatha Yoga is specializing in the body and nervous energy and Raja Yoga is specializing in the Chitta of the subtle body and Yoga of Knowledge is specializing in the discriminating intellect. Bhakti Yoga specializes in the heart and its emotions and Karma Yoga specializes in the will aspect and tantra which is more synthetic so tantra is embracing shakti as a means to evolve into the higher nature so the focus is on shakti the shakti of nature starting from lower nature to ascend to the higher so but the normal action of nature in us is an integral movement in which the full complexity of all our elements is affected by and affects all our environments. They specialize certain activities of the lower prakriti and turn them towards the divine. So as I mentioned, each school specializes in one aspect of the lower nature and then turn it towards the divine, which is the higher nature. But the normal normal action of nature in us is an integral movement in which the full complexity of all our elements is affected by and affects 
all our environments all our environments so here is a very interesting picture the action of nature whether it is lower nature or higher nature it is integral it is one nature that is acting as two and as multiplicity and in that integrality nothing can move without affecting the rest of the whole there is an impact on the environment when an entity an individual make a shift it is influencing the environment the same way the whole environment the whole is influencing the individual so the part and the whole is constantly readjusting realigning according to the movements of the parts the whole is affecting on the part the part is impacting the whole so an integral movement in which the full complexity of our elements is affected by and affects all our environments so the whole of life is the yoga of nature the whole of life is the yoga of nature his line in the first chapter the way he ended the first chapter was saying all life is yoga now he is extending it he is saying the whole of life is the yoga of nature because every little movement in nature is influencing everything else in nature and everything else in nature is influencing every little particle in nature that's why it is an integral movement the yoga that we see must also be an integral action of nature and the whole difference between the yogin and the natural man will be this that the yogin seeks to substitute in himself for the integral action of the lower nature working in and by ego and division the integral action of the higher nature working in and by god and unity so we are replacing the yogin is replacing the integral action of the lower nature with the integral action of the higher nature within the integral action of the lower nature is the division limitation culmination in the ego operating in ignorance and shifting into the integral action of the higher nature which works through god and unity so that's the only difference between an ordinary person and a yogi both are moved by the integral movement of nature but an ordinary person lives in the lower nature bound by the ego bound by the limitations bound by ignorance whereas a yogi transcends them and lives in the higher nature lives in god in unity and that's a transition we have to make if indeed our aim be only an escape from the world to god synthesis is unnecessary and a waste of time so if the goal of the yoga remember yoga has two things one is the very goal the very aim of yoga other is the method of yoga so we need to look at both if the aim is rejection of the lower nature and merging into the higher nature and escape into the higher nature then a synthesis is not required it is a waste of time because all that we are seeking is the formless eternal self 
if indeed our aim be only an escape from the world to God. Synthesis is unnecessary and a waste of time. For then our sole practical aim must be to find out one path out of the thousand that lead to God, one shortest possible of shortcuts, and not to linger exploring different paths that end in the same goal. So there are so many different paths that are leading to the same goal. If it is ascending to that divine consciousness alone, the goal, then look for the shortest path. Why linger checking out every path, bringing all the paths together? It is absolutely not necessary. You look for the shortest path and ascend to the divine nature and forget about the lower nature. If that is the goal, then synthesis is absolutely a waste of time. Just look for the shortcut. But if our aim be a transformation of our integral being into the terms of God existence, it is then that a synthesis becomes necessary. This is where the necessity of synthesis Otherwise, there is no need for synthesis. If our aim be a transformation of our integral being, is not just talking about purification of our being, he is talking about transformation of our being. And not just a part of the being, but our integral being the physical being, the vital being, the mental being, every layer must be brought to its highest perfection, transformed into their divine nature. That's the goal of evolution. That's what nature is working out on earth. The very reason for this creation, for this play. So if our aim be transformation, a transformation of our integral being into the terms of God existence. So God existence, which is very different from the ego level existence. At a level of ego, there is limitation, ignorance and division. At the level of God, there is no limitation. There is omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. The eternal, timeless, infinite. That's the level of existence that we are aspiring for and bringing that into the lower nature. If our aim be a transformation of our integral being into the terms of God existence, it is then that a synthesis becomes necessary. So, for the transformation of the lower nature and bringing that God existence into the lower nature, there the synthesis is necessary. So with that, we end today's podcast. Feel free to share your insights, your learnings, whatsoever it is that can help others to enrich their journey Post it as your comment and thank you. Thank you. See you next week.